Now in the last video I said that the next step would be to set up a simulation or analysis model to look at the fatigue behaviour of the casing for live rear axle. And in this video I want to give the theoretical basis behind this model. I tried to make it as concise and as simple as possible but without dumbing it down However, I do accept that it may not be for everyone and if you're only interested in seeing the results you can jump forward to the next video, number 5. I show the complete model here in flowchart format and we'll now go through the different steps of the flowchart. I'm going to work through the simulation flowchart but I'm not just going to start at the top left corner and work my way down I'm going to jump in at the bottom right and the reason is that this will give context to the rest of the flowchart. Now I want to look at the so-called SN method of fatigue assessment. Now the SN method is by far the most widely used method for calculating fatigue lives and what it does is it relates the stress range acting on a component to the number of cycles to failure hence the S and the N. It's a phenomenological based approach which basically, basically means there isn't much theory behind it and what we're doing is we're fitting curves to a large amount of experimental data. There is an alternative fractal mechanics based approach but that's more specialised. Now I show here a typical SN curve with the supporting data and the first point to note is that it slopes, slopes down to the right. And this means that the higher the stress range, which is plotted on the uh, left-hand axis, the lower the number of cycles to failure. You read that off on the horizontal axis. Now looking at the data, there's a lot of scatter. And indeed we plotted this on a logarithmic scale. And if we plotted this on a simple linear scale, the data would appear to be all over the place. But by plotting it on a log scale, we compress the data and we can see the underlying trend. We fitted a line to it. We could fit a line down the middle, but these wouldn't be very good for design purposes because as many points would lie below the line as, a, as above it. So we've taken the line, which is at mean minus two standard deviations. And what this means is that 97.7% of the points lie above the line and only 2.3% lie below the line. And this is good for design and assessment purposes, but we shouldn't overlook the fact that still more than 2% of the points lie below the line and hence will fail more quickly than the calculated prediction. Now we want to use SN curves which are included in an internationally recognised code of practice. And here I've selected the DNV code, which to my knowledge is by far the most comprehensive for fatigue design. Now the code was uh, derived for offshore oil and gas platforms, but it's equally applicable to other welded steel structures. Now the design curves are presented as a family, which I show here, and each curve has a letter attached to it. We got the B curves at the top going down to the W curves at the bottom and basically the higher the letter the worse the fatigue performance. The B curves can be used with uh, full steel components without welded attachments and without stress raisers. This would include for example the half shafts and the 4x4 although at the splines you do have stress raisers and you wouldn't be able to use this curve. We then range down through a number of welded details with different levels of performance as you see here down to the W curves at the bottom which are pretty terrible. Now the points to note about these curves. Firstly they've all got a slope of 3 to 1 when plotted on a logarithmic scale and to put it in simple terms it means if you double the stress range the design life comes down by a factor of 8. If we look at the high cycle, low, end, uh, low stress range end of the curves, the curves terminate at 10 to the 8 cycles, which is 100 million, which is more than we're going to encounter on the running gear during the design life of a vehicle. And the corresponding stress ranges are from 15 newtons per millimetre squared 
up to 70. Now 15 newtons per millimetre squared is not a very high stress range and basically we can assume that if we've got a poorly designed worldly detail any fluctuating stresses is going to cause uh, cracking and failure sooner or later. So how do we use the curves? Well we take the stress range of interest in this case it's uh, 150 newtons per millimetre squared which is quite a high range we read across to the curve of interest, and in this case I've taken curve E, and then we go down to the horizontal scale to pick off the design life, which is 250,000 cycles. Now, this is if we've got a constant stress range. If we've got a mixture of stress ranges, it gets more, more difficult, but we'll come on to that later. I'm now going to go back to the flow chart for the simulation method and this time we're going to go along the top branch and this is all to do with performing a dynamic analysis and calculating the stress range used for the fatigue analysis. Now the first two boxes on the top left and they are to do with selecting a track and generating the surface profile. Now roads are extremely complicated things and they have infinite uh, variation and something like a corrugated road is a very particular example and here we have surface ripples which are essentially of one wavelength but normal roads aren't like that they're made up of numerous components from short term ripples of quite small amplitude right the way through to long wavelength uh, undulations with much higher amplitude. Now every day there are researchers going out um, measuring surface profiles using different methods and I'd love to get my hands on some of this data because it would make my, my job much easier but this isn't normally put into the public domain. Now this data can become absolutely voluminous you're capturing the surface elevation against the position on the road. And in particular, if you're measuring tens of kilometers of road, you're going to build up gigabytes of data. And if the road quality is essentially the same from start to finish, the data is going to be repetitive and very little extra information is going to be gathered the more data you collect. And so they tend to put it into a different form. And so rather than plotting the surface elevation against the position, they transform it so you're plotting the surface elevation against the wavelength of the undulation which goes into making up the road surface. And the technique used for this is called a discrete Fourier transform and the resulting curve is called a power spectral density or PSD. And I'll show an example here and you can see the data points for the transform data and also the curve which has been fitted through the middle of it. Now if you've got the PSD you can go back the other way and you can regenerate the surface profile and I show here a couple of examples done by other workers. I would emphasize that surface profile you generate isn't going to be identical with what you measured in the first place but it will have the same statistical properties and will give similar results in a dynamic analysis. The International Standards Organization, or ISO, has gathered together surface profile data from around the world and they've broken this down into eight different classes of road. And they published the power spectral densities for these in their International Standard 8608. And the classes range from A, which is extremely good, through to H, which is virtually undrivable. Now these ISO classes are widely used by the motor manufacturers in designing new vehicles. So if, for example, a manufacturer wants to do the fatigue design for a new vehicle, they firstly got to decide what the design life is, maybe half a million uh, kilometers. They will then decide um, what percentage of the time is spent driving on each uh, class of road. And this clearly depends on the type of vehicle. Furthermore, they have to decide what the travel velocity will be in each class of road. 
And what they will then um, compile a number of design cases, or what are often called bins um, in the fatigue world, and they will calculate the fatigue damage in each of the bins, and they'll sum it up in order to simulate the fatigue performance over the design life of the vehicle. Now this is an enormous quantity of work, and it's way beyond what I can do, and so I've had to concentrate on one particular case. I've generated the surface profile corresponding to a Class D road. Now, in descriptive terms, Class D is poor, which means a fairly pothole tarmac road or a, a not very well maintained gravel track. And I've generated just half a kilometre of this. My sampling frequency is down to 20 centimetres. No point going lower than this because there's absolutely no energy down there. And you synthesize the surface profile using sine wave components. So I've got 2,500 sine wave components with, with wavelengths from 20 centimeters up to half a kilometer. This is what I call my digital test track, and I'll use it for all of the dynamic simulations. Going back to the flow chart. The next two boxes, they perform the dynamic analysis and calculate the forces on the suspension. Now this is fairly straightforward. In another video, I've presented a quarter car model, which is used to analyze the effects of driving over corrugations. The model works very well, and I can use exactly the same one here. Except in this case, the road surface is synthesized from 2,500 sine wave components and we also compute the results at 20 centimetre intervals and it basically means we have to solve the equations 6.25 million times. The run times are significant. Going back to the flowchart, the next two boxes say calculate the instantaneous stresses and calculate the stress ranges. Well, we've just done the dynamic analysis um, for the quarter model of the vehicle and we've got these suspension forces and we can convert these into a bending moment along the axle using simple structural theory and if you look at the bending moment diagram you'll see that it's basically zero out at the hub it builds up to a maximum at the spring carrier and it's essentially constant uh, through the central portion of the axle now we know the geometric properties of the axle and using simple beam theory we can calculate the bending stresses in the axle and this is perfectly adequate for uh, current purposes. Now we're left with a whole bunch of stress values and these will be typically at every 50th or 100th of a second. This depends on the sampling distance and the velocity at which the vehicle is travelling. And we've got to make sense of these. Now some of these stress values happen to be peaks, others happen to be troughs, and others will be intermediate values. And the first thing is to knock out the intermediate values which are of no interest to us. So we're left with um, peaks and troughs, but we've still got to calculate the applicable stress ranges. And there's an established technique for doing this, which is called the rain flow counting method, and I'll show the underlying principle of this in the attached graphics. Now the final box on the flow chart says calculate the fatigue damage. Well we've got a whole, um, whole list of stress ranges and for each stress range using the selected SN curve which is applicable to the detail we're studying we know the nominal fatigue life um, measured as numbers of cycles. But what we've got to do is we've got to combine the effect of all of these stress ranges and there's a technique for this which is called a minor summation. So for each stress range we calculate the little bit of fatigue damage which accrues. We add them together to give the total damage um, for that simulation and this is the final number which we are looking for. We've now got to the end of the video, um, fairly long fairly detailed. I've tried to make it as simple as possible. I hope some of you have stuck it out to the end.
And if you've taken the trouble to try to understand what I'm saying, I think you'll have a much better appreciation of what's really going on. For my part, I've now got a good working model which will enable me to look at the fatigue performance of live axles and from this I'll be able to deduce a number of very interesting results.